stand up and just sing. And one way to bring a sweet aroma to God is through worship, is through the sacrifices of our lips. The Bible says, and the sacrifices of our lips, which is pleasing to God, uh, pleasing to God. So that's one way. So we'll practice or give our money, give our lives, break ourselves before God and also worship him. It's a way to give a sweet aroma to God. Oh, be lifted above all other gods, and we lay our crowns and worship. You can sing it loud, oh, be you can lifted. Sing it oh, be lifted above all other aroma before you our God. As we lift up our hands, as we utter with our lips, 
as we bow down, we worship you, our Lord and our Savior. Let it be a sweet savour. Let it be a sweet aroma that rises up to you, O oh God. May you be glorified, Lord, in our midst. Come on, raise that aroma. Break the aroma within you. Raise it before God. Yeah. Let the sweet aroma rise within you this morning. Let God hear your fragrance this morning. Or oh, this afternoon, we worship you. Hallelujah. Let my sweet aroma come before you, God. Shela Kazori and Jala Gazanda Labahanda. Blessed be your name, O God. Blessed be your name. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We'll have such moments to truly worship God in this place. Let's sit down because we want to hear the word. And then we'll take our lunch and have the last session. We are still behind time, but don't worry. We're good. Thank you so much. We want to appreciate you for coming. And uh, it's another time to hear the word. The Women of Grace is always full of the word. That's why the men are here, because we preach the word of Christ that is relevant to all of you. Um, so I don't know what you came for, but we are here to release, to diffuse the knowledge of God. Amen. Amen. And with us to do this session, is my friend, one that I have loved, and uh, we have worked together. God connected us through very divine connection. One time she had me, I mean, one time she, she sent her CD to Kenya, and uh, she didn't know who she was sending to. And I listened to it, and I said, this is a woman of my spirit, the kindred spirit, and uh, the rest has been history. Since she came to the Women of Grace in 2009, we have never held a Women of Grace conference without Dr. Laura. There is none. There is none. That means she has ministered in 13 conferences that we have held. And I love her so much. She has taught me so much. I admire her. By the way, follow her on her Facebook you will be blessed. A woman that is broken. A woman that is loves. The first time Laura opened her mouth, I could feel the fragrance. I smelled the fragrance. It was all over the room. And uh, living a very broken life, a medical doctor by training, but she has never practiced medicine. The day she got her degree from the Lagos University, she gave it to God. She never even one day worked. And her life has fully been before God. That is a great sacrifice. So we honor you, Daktari. Here we call them Daktari. I'm a dog, and uh, I love you. Please come and share with us. And God loves you too. <laughs> we give you an hour. Please put for her an hour so that she can share with us. Let's appreciate her even more. Amen, amen. Thank you so much, my covenant friend, Dr. Lucy. I bring greetings from Nigeria, and I want to appreciate the father of the house, Apostle James. Thank you for always allowing me to come every year. And I honor every man of God, every woman of God in this place. And I've been blessed so far. Reverend Winnie, I honor you and I celebrate you. Father, we appreciate you this afternoon. We give you glory, we give you praise for all that you have been doing, for your fragrance that is here, your aroma is so much in the atmosphere. We thank you. Christ in us, the hope of glory. We are not sufficient. 
by ourselves. But it is your spirit that has made us sufficient. And you have made us able ministers. You have made us to carry your fragrance, your aroma everywhere that we go. Lord, have your way in this place. Let there be a freshness of that aroma, of that fragrance, that we feel this atmosphere, feel our lives, feel even the nations from one generation to the other. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. So I want us to see Second Corinthians, the fragrance of Christ. Second Corinthians 2. From verse 14. Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the savour of his knowledge by us in every place. For we are unto God the sweet savour of Christ, in them that are saved and in them that perish. To the one we are the savour of death unto death, and to the other the savour of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. Fragrance is aroma, perfume, a distinctive odor that is pleasant to the olfactory property. And scent means an odor left in passing by which a person or animal can be traced. And that's why when we abide in Christ, when we are with him, we carry the residue of his spirit, the residue of the aroma. That's why when somebody that has used a perfume that is not adulterated leaves a room, he comes into a room and leaves, there's a residue of that aroma in the atmosphere. So when we abide and remain in Christ, there's a residue of that aroma that we carry. The aroma of his, the spirit, the aroma of his presence that goes with us anywhere that we go. And you know, that's why the Bible says in Psalm 42 verse 1, it says, as the day are panted after the water brooks, so panted my soul after thee, O God. The day doesn't just pant after the water brooks to quench its thirst. There's a peculiar scent that the deer has. That once it gets into the water brooks, the scent of the water cancels the peculiar scent of the deer. So the predator hunting after it cannot trail it again. So when we remain in Christ, when we abide in him, his aroma cancels our own, you know, our own peculiar scent. You know, our own, you know, maybe the manifestations of the flesh is cancelled out when we remain in him. The fragrance of Christ, what are the, where does the aroma come from? Number one, from his name. Songs of Solomon chapter one, verse three. The fragrance of Christ, there's an aroma in his name. There's a scent of his name. He says, because of the savour of thy good ointments, thy name is as ointment poured forth. Therefore do the virgins love thee. When we call his name, there is a release of the anointing. There is a release of the ointment. The name represents a person. And when we call him, the personality shows up. And that personality is the anointed one. So there is a release of the anointing, of the ointment, when we call his name. I want us to see Ecclesiastes 7 verse 1. Ecclesiastes 7 1. A good name is better, is better than precious ointment. A good name is better than precious ointment. A good name is better 
Because even no matter the ointment that somebody carries with a bad name, a bad name or signifying character with a bad character, that character, that bad character becomes dead flies in the ointment. And Ecclesiastes 10.1 says, you know, dead flies in the ointment of the apothecary makes it to send forth a stinking savour. A stink, there's a stench. No matter the anointing that somebody carries with a bad character, it's going to result into a stench. And do you know, Jesus didn't just, that name Jesus is not just a good name, it's a great name. And he obtained that name. He says, we are for God, Philippians 2, had also highly exalted him and given him a great, a, a great name. So he didn't just carry that name. He obtained it. When he passed through the test, the name was given to him as a reward. He went through the test. He went through sufferings. He was broken. Mm -hmm. That solid character of Christ comes out of his brokenness. Isaiah 28, 28 says, Bread corn is bruised. Is the bread corn that was broken for us. His body was broken for us. So he has character, a solid character that comes out from his brokenness. You know, Hebrews 2 verse 10 says, he obtained, he had become a captain of our salvation because he went through sufferings. Just like Apostle was saying, those sufferings broke him. Although he was, you know, he was, in the, he was a god. He, was, he came, you know, like God. He came in the form of a man, but he had to go through sufferings to be broken. And when he's thoroughly broken, he has character, and that character, there is no stench at all in the ointment that he gives. And that's why he's become, he's the breaker. You, know, you cannot give what you don't have. He has gone through breaking. So he, he also is the breaker today. Micah 2, 13. He says the breaker has come to us. So there's an aroma, there's a fragrance that comes out when we call his name in the name of Jesus. Number two. There's an aroma, there's a fragrance that comes out from Christ's testimonies. What he has done and what he's still doing for us. The triumph of his word releases an aroma, releases a fragrance. And that's why don't hide the testimonies that the word is producing in your life. There's an aroma that it produces to compel strangers to come to the Lord. To compel unbelievers to surrender to him. I want us to read that 2 Corinthians 2 again from verse 14. It says, now thanks be unto God which always causes us to triumph. The victory that we have by his word. There is an aroma that that victory, those testimonies produce. You know, and those testimonies bring the fragrance of those testimonies. The aroma compels the unbelievers to surrender their lives to him to become part of the kingdom then number three there's an aroma there's a fragrance that comes from the totality of our lives in the in offering ourselves the totality of our life as an offering as a sacrifice as we burn for him as we burn for him in our daily in our daily life there's an aroma it produces do you know that the, inks, the incense does not produce an aroma until it meets with the fire? That's why when the high priest wants to enter into the holy place, that's the second compartment, he goes with the fire in one hand, the incense. And you know, the incense is compounded from sweet, you know, sweet perfumes. But those, the perfume in the incense does not give a fragrance until it meets with the fire. So the high priest takes the fire in one hand, takes the incense in the other, and pours the incense on the coal of fire. And as the incense starts to burn, the fragrance goes and spreads throughout the tabernacle. So there's, a, there's an aroma that comes out of our life when we present the totality of our life as a sacrifice, 
as an offering on the altar of God. Let's see Romans chapter 12, verse 1. You know, our worship is not just the prayer that we pray. And you know, incense is prayer. Worship is prayer. But it is not just about the prayer, it's not about the worship, but it's about the life that is broken. The life that is presented on the altar. That's where the aroma comes from. And you know, fire does not, God doesn't just release the fire. When the high priest is going into the holy place, he doesn't take the fire from any other place. He takes the fire from the burning altar, from the altar, from the brazen altar. And for God to produce, to, to give us fire, incense cannot burn without fire. And for the fire to come, there must be something sacrificed on the altar. God asks them in the book of Malachi, who kindles, do you kindle fire on my altar in vain? Fire is not kindled in vain. Until there is a sacrifice, the fire cannot fall. So there's an aroma that comes when we present our life, totality of our life as a living sacrifice. Give me Romans 12 verse 1. May we burn for him continually in the name of Jesus. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the masses of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. So we become the sacrifice. He provides the fire. So when the fire meets with the sacrifice, there's a sweet smell. There's an aroma. There's a fragrance that goes out. Then number four. As we bear the sweet odor of Christ's gospel. As we bear the sweet odor of Christ's gospel. Everywhere that we go to the ends of the earth. The Bible talks about the savour of his knowledge by us. The savour of his knowledge by us. There's an aroma in the knowledge of Christ as we share the word. As we carry the gospel of Christ everywhere. It produces an aroma. Let me read it from verse 14. That 14, it says, And make it manifest the savour of his knowledge. That aroma is coming from his knowledge. As we share the word, as we present the gospel by us in every place. For we are not, for we are unto God, the sweet savour of Christ. There's an aroma in the word of God. There's an aroma of the word. And you know, it's only virgins that love the aroma of the word. He says, we are unto some, savour of life to life. To the virgins, those that love the Lord, those that are ready to follow him. We are the savour of life to life. But those that are not ready to follow, we are the savour of death to death. Not everybody enjoys the aroma that is in Christ. Hmm? To a diseased eye, even the light of heaven is injurious. Do you know that when somebody has a fever, even honey becomes bitter? It is said that vultures, they run away from the sweet smell of man. So not everybody enjoys the aroma that is in Christ. It depends on whether you are standing on the side of life. Or standing on the side of death. Even serpents, snakes and serpents, they run from the sweet smell of the oil on the sheep. That's why I said, he anoints my head with oil. The Lord is my shepherd. Why? It's so that because snakes and serpents that could have beaten the, 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 the sheep and the flies, they run away from the smell. The fragrance of Christ chokes demons. They are allergic to the aroma. That's why when the man of Gadara saw him, when he comes into his presence, he said, the demon in him cried out. He's choking already. Have you come to destroy us before the time? What have I to do with thee, O Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to torment me? So that aroma is torment to hell. It's torment to Satan. It's torment to demons. They go into allergic shock when they smell Christ. And that's why when we carry that fragrance everywhere, no serpent is permitting to bite you. They run. Amen. 
And you know why demons ate the fragrance of Christ? Because it's a reminder to them of their sure doom. That they are doomed forever. You know? That triumphant, it says, who caused us to triumph? It's a picture of when the Romans, the kings of the, of the Roman king, when they go to war, after they have won, they celebrate their victory. You know, triumph is different from victory. Triumph is the celebration of victory. That's why if you read Julius Caesar, there is something they call this triumphant entry. When they have gone to battle and they win, then there is a celebration, triumphant procession. And when they are coming into Rome, you know, all the slaves, the spoils of war, they line up. And the city will have stood by the side of the road and making a way for the king to ride. The king rides maybe on a horse, some ride on lions, on uh, elephants. And as, as, as they are, you know, in, in front of the procession, they burn incense. You know, all manners of perfume, clothes that, are, that have been dipped in perfume, they spread it. So the whole place is full of, you know, good ointments and good aroma. And that good aroma is a sign of celebration for the, for the, for the nationals. But it's a sign of doom for the other king that has been captured. And it's the same way. The aroma of Christ is a, is, is a reminder of the sure doom of the devil. That's why they can't stand that aroma. It's reminding them that they will rot in hell. The fragrance of Christ, the aroma of Christ, come from all his garments. Psalm 45. Psalm 45, let me read from verse 1. The aroma of Christ, the fragrance of Christ comes from his garments. Because those garments are immersed. They are soaked in the ointment. Psalm 45, let me read from verse 1. It says, my heart is indicting a good matter. I speak of the things which I have made, touching the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. Thou art fairer than the children of men. Grace is poured into thy lips. Therefore God hath blessed thee forever. Guard thy sword upon thy thigh, O most mighty, with thy glory, and in, with thy glory and thy majesty. And in thy majesty ride prosperously because of truth and meekness and righteousness. And thy right hand shall teach thee terrible things. Thine arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies, whereby the people fall under thee. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Therefore, God, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. All thy garments, I want you to note, all thy garments, not some of the garments, smell of ma. Ma is a component of the anointing of the, of the ointment. And ma stands for brokenness. Unless you are broken, you can't carry the anointing. Just like an apostle has told us, the fragrance cannot flow out. In fact, brokenness, ma, is a major component of the anointing. 500 shekels. Halos and kesia, out of the ivory palaces, whereby they have made thee glad. Christ was so anointed that all his garments drip in, in the, they, you know, they distill the perfume. They distill the aroma. They distill the fragrance. It doesn't just carry a drop of oil. If you will anoint me, that's why, you know, on the day of the inauguration of the high priest, Psalm 133, he says, how good and how pleasant for brethren to dwell together in unity. He says it's like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, a drop of oil can't flow down. 
On the day of the inauguration of the high priest, they don't drop a drop, they don't empty drop of oil. They empty the whole vessel. For it to flow to the skirts of his garment. It's not talking about little oil. Yeah. And you know he's our high priest. Yes, because he's so, he himself is the anointing personified. Yeah. So full of the oil that all his garments... Yeah. In the oriental part of the world, they don't just wear one cloth. They have the inner, they have another one, they have the robe. Yeah. And for Jews, they have the talim that they put. When people go to Jerusalem, they bring it. So all the garments are soaked in the ointment. So there's a fragrance that comes out of the garments of the Lord. Yeah. The divine anointing causes fragrance to distill from the robes of Christ. Let's see sec Song of Solomon chapter 4 from verse 11. Thy lips, so my spouse, drop as the honeycomb. Honey and milk are under thy tongue and the smell of thy garments. Not just garments, garments. Like the smell of Lebanon. There's an aroma, there's a scent, there's a fragrance. Give me Genesis 27, verse 27. Genesis 27, 27. It says, the smell of my son. That's why it's the son that is well pleasing to the father. He came near and kissed him, and he smelled the smell of his raiment and blessed him. The Bible says, thou art most blessed forever. Is the son that pleases the father. And said, see the smell of my son is the smell of a field which the Lord hath blessed. Ecclesiastes 9.8. Let thy garments, not just a garment, because your garment represents your occupation. Yeah. Your garment represents the graces and the gifts that you carry. Yeah. And your graces and your gifts, they point to your calling, to your assignment in the kingdom. Let thy garments be always white. And let thy head lack no ointment. There's a connection between the whiteness of the garment and the ointment. That's why the Bible says that thou hast loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, the Lord thy God has anointed thee. Christ's ointment, Christ's aroma and fragrance is an unlimited aroma. There are some that wear perfume. It doesn't go beyond them. Some wear perfume. Only the person standing next to them can smell it. And others wear perfume. The moment they enter through that door, Depending on the concentration of the aroma. So Christ, as Christ anointing, he says, because he loves righteousness and hated wickedness, the Lord thy God has anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellow. It's an anointing without measure. So the aroma goes from one generation to the other. It doesn't just fill the room. It doesn't just suffice Christ alone. It goes into cities, into nations, even from one generation to the other. That aroma cannot be canceled. All the components of the oil are perfectly blended in Christ in due proportion that there is no stench at all in him. Divinity so much mixed with humanity. You know Christ. Christ is the descent of divinity into humanity and the, and the accent of humanity into divinity. 
the two natures are properly bl blended, that there's no spot or wrinkle in him. All the components of the anointing so perfectly blended in him that there is a sweet aroma. There is a sweet fragrance that oozes out of him everywhere he goes. All his garments sweet to us. We don't just delight in his white robe as a, as a priest. In fact, when that woman with the issue of blood touched the garment, he was touching him as a priest. The robe. Because at the tail end of the robe of a priest, yeah. scriptures are written. Yeah. So when that woman touched the robe, he was touching him as our high priest. With the word, he touched the word. He sent his word and healed them. And deliver them from all their destructions. His white robe of a priest. There's an aroma it brings to us. He's able to save us to the uttermost. Those that have come to God through him. There is also a sweetness in the mantle of his prophetic ministry as a prophet. There's a sweetness we get from the mantle, his prophetic mantle. You remember that woman of Samaria? Carrying pot everywhere, she could not be satisfied. The pot full of all manners of dregs. Had five husbands. And the one she was living with was not her husband. A pot that was full of Pollutions, corruptions, all manners of things, yet could not be satisfied. But when she met with the aroma of the mantle of the prophetic gift on the life of Christ, her thirst was forever quenched. She went to the whole city and took that aroma into the whole city. And the Bible says that everybody came out. He said, come and see the man. Man different from every other man. This man has a perfume, has an aroma. And all the men in the city came out. All his garments distilled with aroma and fragrance. What about the sweetness of his purple robe as our king? He doesn't, he doesn't just wear the white robe of our high priest. He does not just have the mantle as a prophet. He also has the purple robe as our king. I want us to see the book of Mark 14, his purple robe of dominion. Mark 15, verse 17, his purple robe of dominion. Kingship, representing kingship, royalty. And they clothe him with purple. Purple stands for royalty. And plated a crown of thorns and put it about his head. There's a sweetness, there's an aroma, there's a fragrance that oozes out from his purple robe of dominion as our king. A king that doesn't have oppression, that does not oppress. A king that is not a usurper. No dead flies in his oil as our king. I want us to see Psalm 45 verse 4. Psalm 45 verse 4. We delight in his reigning as our king. And in thy majesty ride prosperously because of truth and meekness and righteousness. And thy right hand shall teach thee terrible things. This king is different from every other king. No oppression in him. The wheels of his chariot are truth, meekness, and righteousness. 
truth talks about justice and judgment. You cannot bribe him mm, to condemn the just and vindicate the unjust. That's why we can trust in him. That's why we can put our entire life. That's why we are safe in his kingdom. The harrow and the fragrance of his purple robe. There's a sweetness that we enjoy from it. Truth. He himself is the truth. No lie, no deception, no iota of darkness in him. Meekness. Lowly and yet the most mighty. Lowly and yet the most high, El Elyon. When you get to him, you can't, you can't go any further. Jacob's ladder, he saw him. I saw the Lord standing above it. Above it, no other person can go beyond. And yet, lowly, in his triumphant entry to Jerusalem, he, he, cho he chose to ride on the ass. History has it to say that many of those Roman kings, when they are coming in into their triumphant entry back to Rome after their conquest. Some of them ride lions. Some ride horses. Some ride elephants. But our own king in his sweetness is not coming to come and raise a dust into the nose of everybody standing. He's not coming with so much pomp and pageantry to scatter everywhere. Has represent meekness. He doesn't have to be meek. There's a sweetness that we enjoy from his meekness. In fact, David said, your meekness, your gentleness has made me great. Though he's mighty, yet he can, we do not have a high priest that cannot be touched. If not for his meekness and gentleness, many of us will have been laid aside. It's only his gentleness that makes us great. Patience in dealing with us. Long-suffering in bearing with our infirmities. There's an aroma and a fragrance we enjoy as a result of that purple robe of meekness. Righteousness. He doesn't just wake up one day and say, we have changed the Bible. No unrighteous decrees. That's why we are safe in the kingdom. Proverbs 16, verse 10. The purple robe of his dominion. Proverbs 16.10 Divination is in, on the lips of the king. His mouth, mouth must not transgress in judgment. Then Isaiah 32.1 says A king shall reign in righteousness and princes shall rule in judgment. That's why he has a kingdom that is everlasting. That's why his fragrance and aroma are unlimited. He says, for you love righteousness and hated wickedness. That's why he has everlasting kingship. Thy throne, no God, is forever and ever. Because righteousness is what establishes thrones. Number two, the purple robe of his dominion. Number two, He's our king, and at the same time, he's our warrior. He's a king warrior. Not a complacent king. The sweetness and the aroma he brings to us in being ready to fight our battles. Psalm 45, verse 3. Psalm 45, verse 3. Guard your sword upon your thigh, O mighty one, with your glory and your majesty. 
they said that the garden of the, of the saw to the thigh is part of royal inauguration. So our own king, there's a sweetness he brings to us in that he saw this ready to be drawn out against any enemy that comes after you. That sword is placed where it can easily be drawn out for you to give you conquest and defense from your enemies. That sword has been placed where it is easily available for use. Let's see Songs of Solomon 3, verse 8. That's why no lion will roar against you. Because we have a king. The king fight the battles for his people. He says, they hold, they all hold swords, being expert in war. Every man has his word on his thigh because of fear in the night. You don't need to be afraid in this gross darkness. You know, this is the night season in the program of God. But we have a king that his sword is by the thigh. Easy to, you know, ready to bring it out. To cut down whosoever will terrorize you. Revelations 1.16. And you know, that sword is also his word. When John saw the resurrected Christ, he says he had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And that is the sword he used to cut down his enemies. Let's also see Psalm 45 verse 16. He's not just our warrior, but he has raised many of us to also be warriors. He has trained us to be warriors. It's like he's our David. David has raised mighty men. Do you know something? In the time of Saul, the Bible says that when Saul went to battle, when he was first installed as a king, on the day of battle, there was no sword found with any man, only with Saul and Jonathan. Nobody knew how to wield the sword. But not this king. I'm one of the ones he has trained to wield the sword. What about you? You are looking at me. What about you? You won't be like the wives of David and the mighty men. How can you be by the side of a mighty man and you have not learned the art of war? That was why when David was not around and the mighty men, yeah. the wives, the children, they came and used wheelbarrow. Is there a wheelbarrow here? Yeah. And carted them away. How can you be by the side of a mighty warrior and you have not learned to wield the war, the, the instruments, the weapons of war? So it's not just our warrior king, it's also our trainer in war. So there's an aroma and fragrance that comes from that. No devil can wheelbarrow me away. I will fight. I can't be carried away like vegetables. Like carrots. Like potatoes. Let's see Psalm 45 verse 16. Instead of your fathers shall be your sons whom you shall make princes in all the earth. We are the crown prince. We know how to walk. And you know, the church is not just the wife of a king. It's also the mother of kings. Instead of your fathers shall be your sons, whom you shall make princes in all the earth. We give back to kings that rule and reign in every aspect of life. So the church is... The wife of a king, the church is the mother of a king, and the church is the daughter of a king. Three in one. That's what that aroma has given to us, that fragrance. So anywhere I go, I carry the aroma of a king, king's daughter, king's wife, and mother of a king.
I'll give back to kings. I want us to see Psalm 110 verse 5. It's not just our king warrior. We delight in that robe. That is purple robe of dominion as our king. But he also raises, we share in that purple robe that he has. We share in that purple robe of his dominion. Psalm 110 verse 5. He says, the Lord that is at your right hand, he shall execute kings in the day of his wrath. King James says, he shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. And we are those kings. He's already striking through us now. Jesus is not here to be fighting all these uh, things on the earth. You agree with me? 1 Samuel 13 verse 22. That's why David is a type of Christ. In the time of Saul. See the situation in the time of Saul. So it came about on the day of battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people who were with Saul and Jonathan. But they were found with Saul and Jonathan his son. Can you compare this to David? In fact, it says that there was no smith in Israel at this time. No craftsman. No carpenter. Our king himself is the carpenter. In those days, carpenter, doesn't, they don't just deal in wood. They bring out instruments, weapons. And that was why in the time of David, you, saw, you see him raising mighty men. He was a craft, craftsman. He's a carpenter. But Saul didn't raise any. No sword found. No smith on the day of battle. In fact, they had to go and sharpen their mattock. In the, in the enemy's camp, the Philistines made sure that there was no smith in Israel. That's why he's a smith. I'm a smithess. <laughs> the five-fold ministry gift, they are smiths. Yes. They are craftsmen. Yes. They are carpenters. Yeah. We supply you arms to go and fight. We teach you how to handle the sword. That's part of the aroma and the fragrance of his purple robe of dominion. This our king rules by his sayings. He rules by his sayings, by his sword and by his scepter. Jesus rules by his sayings, sword and his scepter. And we thank God that he has shared his dominion with us. So we carry that fragrance and aroma of dominion everywhere we go. As our king, his arrows are sharp. His arrows are sharp. Psalm 45 verse 5. His arrows are sharp. He's able to execute his counsel. Sharp arrows. He doesn't have weapons that are blunt, that cannot deliver you, that cannot save you in the day of trouble. His arrows are sharp. Your arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies. The peoples fall under thee. No man can stand up to our king. That's why we enjoy, you know, we delight in that sweetness. And you know, those sharp arrows also represent his words. Let's see Psalm 120 verse 34. Psalm 120 verse 34. His words, they are sharp arrows. They are thrown into the hearts of men. What shall be given to you? Oh, what shall be done to you? You false tongue. Verse 4. Sharp arrows of the warrior. His words are sharp arrows. He doesn't throw them into your head. He throws them into your heart. He rules by the power of conviction. He doesn't beat you down with belt like a coward husband. <laughs> you can't come and arrest me. Like a coward husband. Hmm? But he rules with his, with his words. The power of conviction. His, his arrows are sharp in the heart. In the heart. 
to make you to break down, to make you to surrender, to make you to submit. And as sons of God, as mature sons, you are part of his arrow. Psalm 127 says, as arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are the children of the youth. Number four, as our king, we delight in the aroma of his provisions. As our king, we delight in his aroma of his provisions. Is our David, 2 Samuel 6, 2. Aroma of the wine on his table. Aroma of spiced wine, not just ordinary wine yeah. on his table. Aroma of the meat of his table. Aroma of the flesh on his table. Second Samuel 6, 19. Then he distributed among all the people, among the whole multitude of Israel, both the women and the men, to everyone a loaf of bread, a piece of meat, and a cake of raisins, a flagon of wine. So all the people departed everyone to his house. When you come into his banqueting table, there's an aroma and a fragrance from his table. Like Solomon's table, when the queen of Sheba got into the palace of Solomon and he came to the table, she fainted. She saw the meat on the table. Our king has provision to offer. We are not, we are not having a mar marasmus and kwa shoko. Compared to Saul, there was something that David fed those mighty men. Can you imagine? Men with the three Ds. In debt, in distress, discontented. You are what you eat. He fed them so much that they became mighty men. In fact, the Bible says that they are like lions. They don't know how to turn back from war. Any month that there is no battle to, to fight, they are wondering what is happening. Because David fed them so much. He fed them. That's why Jesus said, Bible said in Psalm 77, 78, give it to me. Psalm 78. Psalm 78. The last verse. He fed them. Our own king, Christ, is feeding us. We delight in the aroma and the fragrance of the meat on his table and the spiced wine. So he shepherded them according to the integrity of his heart. KJV says he fed them according. What is the purpose of being a king and everybody's hungry? Even the dogs are barking, no food. So he fed them according to the integrity of his heart and guarded them by the skillfulness of his hand. You can't compare this to Saul. Let's make comparison with Saul. 2 Samuel 1, 24. With the light in the harrow and the fragrance of his table. Wine, meat, flesh. 2 Samuel 1, 24. Saul didn't feed any man. O daughters of Israel, weep over Saul, who clothes you in scarlet with luxury, who put ornaments of gold on your apparel. Saul's impact couldn't go beyond the skin, superficial. He didn't clothe their spirit, he clothed their body. That was why they couldn't stand before their enemies. They had no strength to stand before the enemies. superficial ornaments he put on them but he didn't put ornaments in their spirit because it is bread that strengthens your heart it is wine that makes your eyes to be red the wisdom of a man makes his face to shine and his countenance can be changed wine gives you a boldness you have seen a drunken man before 
he stands before the trailer. They call me, I, I'm here for you. <laughs> Why gives boldness? So Saul produces men. He produced men that couldn't stand before the enemy because he only clothed them superficially. But the David fed them. They were fed so much that they didn't know how to turn back from the enemy. One handled the sword until he killed 800. Stuck in his hand. Well-fed men. So we rejoice in the aroma of the food, the provisions on his table. As our king... Number two, he doesn't just have the white robe of our priest, high priest. He doesn't just have the, the mantle of the prophet or the purple robe of a king. We also rejoice in the aroma and the fragrance of his seamless coat. He has a seamless coat. The seamless coat as our friend. Let's go to John 19. I hope you are getting something this morning. Are you following me? The seamless coat. We, we rejoice in the aroma of his seamless coat as our friend. The friend that sticketh closer than a brother. John 19, 23. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts. And you see, all these garments are, they smell. And those garments, they reach to the four corners of the heart. Are you getting me? To the north, to the south, to the east, to the west. To each soldier, a part, and also the tunic. Now the tunic was without seam, woven from the top in one piece. We rejoice in the aroma of his seamless coat as our friend. Number one, that seamless coat represents boundless love of, of, of a friend. Love that doesn't have bound, limitless love. A love that goes beyond time, space, and magnitude. Songs of Solomon 2.13. Boundless love of a friend. A friend that sticketh closer than a brother. He loves you at every season. A friend loveth at all times. A brother born for adversity. That's our Christ. His garment of a friend drips with aroma and fragrance. Songs of Solomon 2.13. The fig tree puts forth a green figs and the vines with tender grapes give a good smell. You know, it's, it's like that. That's why Joseph is a type of Christ. Joseph, Genesis 49.22 says, Joseph is a fruitful bow. That reaches over the wall. Let's, let's go there. Genesis 49, 22. Joseph is a fruitful bow. A fruitful bow by a well. His branches run over the wall. Just like the seamless coat of Christ. Joseph too. His branches run over the wall. The love of Christ as a friend crosses geographical boundary. Joseph too cross geographical boundary. From his father's house, he went to become prime minister where? In Egypt. Branch that ran over the wall. So that everybody can come under that overspread of his branches. Everyone is permitted to come under the aroma of Christ. Seamless. No limit. Boundless love. Taste and see. Come from every nation. Taste and see. That the Lord is good. That aroma is overspread everywhere. It crosses geographical boundaries. 
Christians are in uh, Alaska, born again Christians. They are in Australia, geographical boundary. That's why I don't say that Nigerian has come again. <laughs> we are one in Christ. Amen. Blood is thicker than water. Yeah. The blood of Christ is thicker than the water of another Kenyan. So don't say that Nigerian has come. No. We are one in Christ Jesus. You are my friend. Because that robe, the aroma of Christ's robe is seamless. Riches everywhere to the ends of the heart, to the four corners of the heart. It's our Joseph. Branches that cross Reaches over the wall. He breaks, he, he break, you know, he breaks social walls. Hebrews don't eat with the Jews. But in the time of Joseph, Joseph was in their midst. Yes. The seamless coat of Christ breaks religious walls. They wonder when they saw him speaking with the Samaritan woman, what have you got to do? Even that woman said, the Jews have nothing to do with... Uh, they said, we will worship God. That was a religious limit. Yeah. But Jesus, as a friend, reaching to that woman of Samaria, broke that limitation. Yeah. He broke cultural limitation. Who am I as a woman to handle the mic? That a woman is only good in the kitchen. Only fit for the outer court. That was why they're always surprised when they see him talking to women. The seamless coat of a friend reaches to the women and brought them in into the holies of holy. That's why I can handle the mic. I share in that garment that he has. All the gifts and the graces, there's an aroma that comes out of those garments. Prophet, teacher, priest, apostle, friend. We rejoice in the fragrance. The fragrance is overspread, no walls. It breaks gender limits. Luke 8.1. Luke 8.1. There were many women that ministered to him out of their substance. Many women ministered to him out of their substance. The seamless robe of a friend in showing extravagant love. And you know, every true love is extravagance and like a waste. When Jesus went to the cross, as our friend, he didn't just drop, just a drop of his blood. He emptied his blood. That's why when you see the resurrected Christ today, he's flesh and bone. No blood. If you take drip from him, no blood will come out. We only eat bone. After the flesh. Because every ounce of the blood was poured. As a friend, you know, his love is extravagance. That was why when that woman came pouring the oil, Judah said, what a waste. She loves going to sell it. She loves going to sell it and, and receive a year's salary. So as our friend, he loves us at all times. The Bible says that his friend loves it at all times. Some only love you when you have money. Some checks out on you even in church. Do you know how to dress before they will relate to you? I didn't come here to teach you how to dress. I come here to preach. Clap your hands. <laughs> he loves at all times. Whether you are low, whether you are high, you are wearing rags, you are dressed in there, he loves at all times. (laughs) 
extravagance and waste is the principal quality of true love. That's why when you stay in alignment to him, the oil will reach you. Let's see Romans 5, 17. And that's why David too is an extravagant man. You see, he danced so much before the Lord, he exceeded, he exceeded until my, my car had to remind him, don't you know you are a king? This one is too much. It's like Christ that he represents. He committed an error. They said, go and sacrifice on the ground of Arauno. The man said, I will give you everything. He said, God forbid that I give my God a sacrifice that will cost me nothing. He desired to build the temple. That's why he's a type of Christ, the Bible. If it were to be some of you, you desire to be temple. They said, don't worry. You say, thank God. They said, I should not worry again. <laughs> Let me keep my money. Not David. He says, of my own substance, I have gathered the things of gold, the things of silver. Everything he gathered did in abundance. David was extravagant and is just like the Christ that he represents. That's why no aroma when we when we give in drops. Some they open their tap and they lock it and it's doing to to <laughs> offering it to to who do you look like? Extravagance, love, exceed. That's why even his mercy, the Bible says that the God that is rich in mercy, rich in grace, everything about him is exceeding abundant. The Lord that is able to do exceeding abundant, above what we can ask or think. There's an aroma and a fragrance we enjoy from his extravagance. Extravagant love. The prodigal son missed it. He didn't, you know, didn't turn him away. How many times we have missed it? We keep on coming, yet he keeps on receiving us. The good Samaritan. Hmm? The good friend, the man that he himself is the good Samaritan, is a stranger. He came from heaven. He came from heaven. All of us, man, the fallen man is traversing between Jerusalem and Jericho. This heart is a cursed place, Jericho. But he saw us broken, wounded by robbers. Satan is a thief. He came to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And he saw us wounded, helpless. He's the good Samaritan. He came down from the horse, left his glory, and came down. All the riches that he had, he emptied himself. And came down, the same way that Samaritan came down from the horse. To reach out to the man. Love is always flowing down, condescending. Fell, came down from the earth to attend to that man. Pour oil. He gave us his Holy Spirit as a seal on the wound. Mm -hmm. To refresh, to comfort. He carried us. A man. was walking on the shore and he saw his footprints and he saw that there were four legs. So God was walking with him. Two legs, his own two legs. And at a point, two legs disappeared. The prints of the two legs disappeared. 
And he said, God, there was a time you abandoned me. I could only see two legs, my own legs. Where were you when I was going through marital discomfort? Where were you when all these things, as if my word was scattered? God said, no. Those legs that you saw, the prints, they are not your legs, they are mine. Those times you couldn't walk, I had to carry you. The good Samaritan. When nobody is ready to carry you, some of us, we will have gone into depression. The seamless coat of the friend. When I could not walk, carried me. The friend shepherd. If not for him, many of us will be in psychiatric ward by now. Carried you. You look to the front, no man. To the side, nobody. Even talk by Oluda Ramola, no, no, was not there. <laughs> it's better if you don't know. <laughs> carried you. Carried you. Carried you. Singing glory, glory. Let's rise up on our feet. Holy, holy, are you, Lord? The redeemed worship you now. Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. Worship you now. The sound of many waters coming from the throne of God. He's a sound of adoration as men from every nation lift their voice. Let the choir Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. Holy, 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 holy are you, Lord. He and the angel sound. The redeemed worship you now. Father, we appreciate you. 
we rejoice in the aroma of your royal purple as our king. We rejoice in the fragrance, the sweetness of your seamless coat as our friend. We appreciate you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Our king, our friend, our teacher, our prophet, and our high priest. Thank you for your fragrance. Thank you for your aroma. Let your name continually be glorified. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name.